Hey there, everybody. Good morning. It is Monday, the 11th of October, 2021, 10.01 in the morning, and we're here with Job, chapter number 36. And I'm just going to shoot straight with you. I'm tired of Elihu. We're going to hear from him again today. We're going to hear from him again tomorrow. I'm not sure if he goes on bloviating in chapter 38 or not. Uh, I think so, but I'm not exactly sure, but I'm sick of this kid already. Uh, we To catch you up, if you don't know who I'm talking about, Job has had three friends that he's having conversations with. The bulk of this book, chapter 3 on through now, 33 chapters of this stuff, I'm growing weary. I'm just going to be honest with you. I love the Bible. I love the truth of the book of Job, but 33 chapters of these people going back and forth. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll bring out a principle there that I think applies and when we get to the end, but Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, they were at least somewhat courteous to Job. They were a little pushy. They were completely wrong, out of line, but Elihu takes the cake on those three guys. So let's pray and uh, we'll read what this knucklehead has to say. Father, we ask your blessing on our reading and our study today. You know I'm weary of this. <laughs> Maybe that's what you're trying to get across. I'm not sure. Help us, please, to learn and grow from it. In Christ's name, amen. All right, so 33 verses he, Elihu also proceeded and said, Suffer me a little, and I will show thee that I have yet to speak on God's behalf. Suffer me a little. We've already listened to him, I think, for three chapters so far. 34, 35, now 36. And he's saying, Suffer me a little. You know, he's, he can tell. I believe these guys are getting impatient with him. He's talking and talking and talking. Forbear me, furthermore. Uh, on and on he's going. Suffer is a very appropriate word because that's what we're doing at this point, listening to Elihu go on. He has to up his ante here. Though uh, I will show thee that I have yet to speak on God's behalf. Now he's saying, look, you need to listen to me because God is speaking through me to you. And he is the one who's been most uh, rough, unkind, and and deliberately offensive to Job. He has not pulled any punches. He has just told him exactly what he thinks. Uh, he is a pompous, arrogant, narcissistic young man who thinks he's got this all figured out. And I tell you, to all of you young, arrogant, pompous, narcissistic young men, you need to dial yourself back. You need to consider that your life experience is limited at this point. You don't know what you think you know. You don't know what you think older people have failed to learn. Older folks have been down the road. They've experienced a lot. They've seen your kind before. You don't impress them. The wisdom of youth is humility. As a young person, exhibit great humility, and you'll find yourself far better off for it. So, Elihu also proceeded and said, Suffer me a little, and I'll show thee that I have yet to speak on God's behalf. I will fetch my knowledge from afar. I will ascribe righteousness to my Maker. For truly my word shall not be false. He that is perfect in knowledge is with thee. So these first four verses are Elihu telling these people that, hey, now that I'm here to tell you what God said, it's as though God were here directing you. He's really telling these people that he is speaking on behalf of God for their benefit. That is very arrogant, uh, and he's not. So that can show you that people can be mistaken about it. Verse 5. Now, some of the things he says, again, are accurate and true, but the way he directs them to Job is inaccurate. Behold, God is mighty and despiseth not any. He is mighty in strength and wisdom. Is that true of God? It absolutely is. He preserveth not the life of the wicked, but giveth right to the poor. He withdraweth not his eyes from the righteous, but the kings are they on the throne. Uh, yea, he doth establish them forever, and they are exalted. And if they be found in fetters, and beholden in cords of affliction, then he showeth them their work, and their transgressions that they have exceeded. 
He openeth also their ear to discipline, and commandeth that they return from iniquity. If they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasures. But if they obey not, they shall perish by the sword, and they shall die without knowledge. And so this is more of that reaping and sowing philosophy. If you do right, only good will happen to you. If you do wrong, only bad will happen to you. The truth is that Job and his three friends have already debated this and determined it to not be accurate and true. But here Elihu is speaking out of a place of pride, trying to get acknowledgement for wisdom that he does not possess. Verse 13, but the hypocrites in heart heap up wrath, They cry not when he bindeth them. They die in youth, and their life is among the unclean. I don't know how he uh, describes Job then, because he's calling Job wicked, but Job is an old man. He is not dead in his youth, certainly. He delivereth the poor in his affliction, and openeth their ears in oppression. Even so would he have removed thee out of the strait, into a broad place where there is no straightness, and that which should be set on thy table should be full of fatness. But thou hast fulfilled the judgment of the wicked. Judgment and justice take hold on thee. Because there is wrath, beware, lest he take thee away with his stroke. Then a great ransom cannot deliver thee. Will he esteem thy riches? No, not gold, nor all the forces of strength. Desire not the night when people are cut off in their place. Take heed, regard not iniquity. For this hast thou chosen rather than affliction. Behold, God exalteth by his power, who teacheth like him, who hath enjoined him his way, or who can say, thou hast wrought iniquity. And just more going on about God blessing the righteous and destroying the wicked, God giving his blessing and attention to the righteous while ignoring and taking from the wicked. And these aren't hard and fast rules. And that's what Job teaches us. That is what we learn from the life of Joseph. That's what we learn from the life of David. Joseph, David, Daniel, Job. These are all godly, righteous men who endured great suffering and injustices. Uh, So the idea, the thoughts of Elihu and the friends, they're immature understandings of how the world and life works. Verse number 24, I guess. Remember that thou magnify his work, which men behold. Every man may see it. Man may behold it afar off. Behold, God is great, and we know him not. Neither can the number of his years be searched out. For he maketh the small drops of water. They pour down rain according to the vapor thereof which the clouds do drop and distill upon man abundantly. Also can any understand the spreadings of the clouds or the noise of his tabernacle? Behold, he spreadeth his light upon it and covereth the bottom of the sea. For by them judgeth he the people, he giveth meat in abundance. With clouds he covereth the light and commandeth it not to shine by the cloud that cometh betwixt. The noise thereof showeth concerning it, the cattle also concerning the vapor." And then you see chapter 37, verse 1, he continues on. I'm weary, ladies and gentlemen. (laughs) I'm really tired of this book. Forgive me. (laughs) I know that it's wrong for a preacher to say that he's tired of a book of the Bible, right? And, And maybe that's the point. Maybe that's what God is getting across to us, that this kind of futile, arguing this kind of incessant seeking for justice and and understanding and comprehension of suffering is futile in the end. You're not going to get it all. The most often asked question amongst Christians who are suffering is why. That's the most oft question. Why? Why, pastor? Why, God? Why? Why is this happening to me? The most unanswered question, why? We don't always know why. We don't get to understand why. Look at Daniel's life. Why was he taken into captivity? Why did he have to undergo the 
separation with the eunuchs? Why did he have to deal with the statue being erected? Why did he have to go through the lion's den? Why, why, why? None of this makes any sense. Why is Joseph uh, accused falsely? Why is he despised by his brothers? Why does he get ignored in prison after interpreting the dreams? Now, we have hindsight. Hindsight is always 2020. You can always figure it out after the fact. But when we're the ones in prison, when we're the ones in captivity, when we're the ones enduring the lion's den, when we're the ones running from enemies through the woods and hiding in caves, we don't know why and we don't get to understand why. And so all of this philosophizing is a waste of time. Uh, sitting down, uh, you know, attacking other people. It's, it's an exercise in futility to rehearse this stuff over and over and over again. You know, social media is a good uh, place to find the, the <laughs> ineffectiveness of constant debate. Because the subject that was discussed a week ago and a month ago, they're not even mentioned today. You know, it's funny. I haven't heard anyone say anything this football season about kneeling during the national anthem. I haven't heard anyone say anything about it. And I don't know. Maybe it's still going on. Maybe it's not going on. So what, what, what's the question here? The, the players that knelt last season, are they still kneeling this season? And if not, why not? And those people that said, I'll never watch another football game as long as these players are kneeling. Well, if they're still kneeling, are you still watching? No one's talking about it. Because in the end, it doesn't matter. These things, that they're just, they're used as, as fuel for dissension. And that's what's happening with these guys. It's exhausting and it's unproductive and unprofitable. This constant fight. What's the, you, you, you look, look, go build something with your life rather than fight. Go help people rather than fight. Now, there is a time to fight and there is a time to take a stand, but you can take a stand without sitting in a room uh, arguing over your stand. Just live it. That's the stand. Just, you know, find, find a member of the opposite sex and court them and marry them and have babies and train those children according to the Bible. There's your stand. Uh, I don't know. I'm exhausted now, aren't I? <laughs> I'm a little too wrapped up in all of this. I'm just fed up with it. And tomorrow, there's more. Chapter 37, Elihu. Let me scroll and see what I'm dealing with here. Chapter 37 is Elihu, 38, the Lord speaks. Finally, we're done with these four friends. Tomorrow, last, last bit of torture. And then God finally relieves us in chapter 38. All right, I guess knowing that, I have some hope. I can persevere. <laughs> you persevere with me tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. As always, like, love, and share the post, please. We'll see you tomorrow. God bless you. Have a great Monday. Have a great week.